Via the notion of upper gradients, we have defined the class of Newtonian Sobel functions on metric measure spaces. And the two examples you see on the screen are, to me, two of the most important and critical ones to fully understand. On the left, we have the function u1, which is equal to 1 only at the origin and 0 everywhere else. And on the right, we have a function that is equal to 1 on a line segment and 0 everywhere else. Although both of these functions are 0 almost everywhere with respect to the Lebesgue measure, one of them is in the Newtonian class and the other one is not. And through multiple videos, we went into extreme pains to fully prove the two claims in all details. Moreover, we proved that the function on the left, u1, actually has zero norm, where norm is defined by infimizing over all integrable upper gradients, um, which was also a critical example because it shows us the necessity to identify functions if we want to get a normed space. So in this case, u1 is necessarily must be cautioned out to be equivalent to the zero function so that the space N12 does become a norm space. So what tells these functions apart? How could we tell if I give you a third function, which is somewhere in between the two, it is, say, equal to 1 on a set more than a singleton but is smaller than, say, a full line segment, where is the threshold? Depending on the size of the set, will, it, will the characteristic function of this belong to N12 or not? What is, the, what is the gauge, what is the tool to tell this? And the answer is that of the capacity. So, um, we're looking at two capacity here because we're looking at N1P. So to talk about functions in N1P, we um, have to deal with sets of P capacity uh, zero or not. Um, that's one notion that is needed for further study of Newtonian Sobel functions, the notion of capacity of sets. And the other notion, uh, another way of looking at this is through the definition of upper gradient itself. Remember that part of um, the pain in proving that this function belongs to the um, Sobolev class was to make sure that we find an upper gradient row so that um, the upper gradient inequality, this one here, works in, sp in particular for curves that meet the origin. So for every other curve, like this one, which has nothing to do with the origin, there is nothing to prove, and rho equals zero would perfectly work as an upper gradient. However, for those curves that end in the origin, the difference at the end points of u values is one, so we needed to make sure that this upper gradient um, integral is at least one for every curve, which also forced us to have infinity near zero so that we captured this, that inequality even for extremely tiny curves. And it's kind of unfair that just one point poses us so much challenge. Uh, and that is something we don't like, especially because we want to talk about measurable functions and we're used to this notion that we can neglect things, we can be flexible, we can, for, uh, we can sacrifice um, negligible sets, negligible collections, and that leads us to the notion of modulus of curve families. So once we, so notion one was capacity of sets, and notion two, which by the way these two are related, not surprisingly, so the modulus of path families will give us a way to just look at this example and immediately say, okay, um, rho equals zero just is good enough of an upper gradient because 
the whole collection of curves where it fails uh, has modulus zero. In this case, uh, one has to know that the modulus of all curves passing through a single point in the plane has two modulus zero, which then means that uh, we can say the collection, this row zero is as good as um, is enough for an upper gradient because the set of the collection of curves where it fails is negligible, has modulus zero. So this second tool, again, will be very helpful. The reason U2 is not in the Newtonian space um, is twofold. Number one, that T is has um, capacity positive, not zero. That is, T is too large a set. Or you can say that the modulus of all curves which end up passing through this t is also not negligible, not zero. So the collection of all curves passing through this segment uh, by help of Fubini's theorem can be shown uh, to be positive, although we haven't even defined what modulus is. But anyway, um, this is kind of uh, what is going to happen next in our treatment of Newtonian Sobolev spaces. However, I want to um, not rush this as I had promised. First of all, to give you a chance to catch up with all the videos that I uploaded during these uh, holidays. And number two, we haven't even looked at multiple examples of metric measure spaces and um, try to understand what the Newtonian class N1P looks like on them, how that class changes with respect to P. And, and what not. So both of these notions, let me emphasize that depend on this exponential P that is very important. We know how in the classical uh, world of Sobel functions, W1P functions have very different behaviors for different P's. And the same goes with, uh, of course, the Newtonian Sobolev class of functions. So that will be the future. Let me know in the comments how um, how fast you want them, how excited you are to see these two. Uh, but I think it's 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 a worthwhile effort to to try to look at some examples, beginning with even like finite metric measure spaces, and uh, my next few videos will be focused on this. Until then, have a good one.